We thank the Lord for the young voices, uh, for children that are learning to praise God and to use their gifts and their talents to exalt his name. Today we have, you know, a few of our members who are celebrating different things. And I think it's important to highlight that. But before I get into that, I just want to let us know, I'm not sure, I don't think we announced it earlier, uh, that Minister Jones has been hospitalized uh, since last week. He is in uh, a Presbyterian Hospital in Manhattan. So let us uh, keep Minister Jones in, in our prayers. Also, Sister, well, she missed it earlier, and I was going to announce it, but she's missing it again because she's back again with the choir in the back. Uh, but I'll say it anyway, Sister Winnie Campbell, she was with the choir in the back earlier, but she's celebrating a birthday today, and we just wanted to make sure that we highlighted that. But also, some of our members have, you know, reached a few milestones in their lives. And it came to my attention that Sister Marlene Smith, uh, she retired yesterday, as a matter of fact, after working for the Department of Buildings for 39 years. For 39 years. Uh, yes, there she is. Wave, Sister Smith. So folks know who you are. <laughs> for those who don't know. Praise the Lord. We give God thanks for that. And now I call retirement um, freedom with sustentation so you can now do the work you want to do. <laughs> Praise God for that. Also, Captain Linda uh, Rock, she turned 25 with NYPD, <laughs> has been serving for 25 years with NYPD. Just, just wave, my sis. Praise the Lord. We, we want to give God thanks for that. The Lord has kept you, has kept you safe, and uh, we hope that he will continue to do that as well. Also, um, one of our young members, Sister Crystal Bailey, she has been, been accepted for a little while now in a very important internship. It is called, the program is called Talent Development Program for Advertising. And out of thousands, she was chosen. And she is in the MAIP. Uh, she is interning now in, 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 in advertising and marketing, and she is doing excellently well. I've seen some videos uh, that she has worked on. So let us support our young people yeah. as they're doing great exploits for the Lord. And then finally, um, I saw the Altino brothers on TV this week. <laughs> and once again, they are making us proud. And they are being hailed as, as, as New Yorkers who are virtuosos on the piano, who are taking a great new approach to classical music, being influenced by gospel and by... R&B and all the other genres in this city. So they are great New Yorkers who are making us all very proud. We are proud of you, Brother Altino. Convey that to your brother also. And um, in that piece, you know, they spoke about, uh, because the, the interviewer was asking, uh, so, so, how did you guys get into classical music? You know, no, there's, there's a subtext for that question. And it was like, oh, to you, two black kids from, black kids from Haiti, interested in classical music. That's what she really wanted to ask. You know, I, I'm editing her now. But anyway, uh, and, and they, they spoke about uh, Father Altino, how they woke up every morning to classical music in the house. And that was the great influence that uh, sparked the love for that music. So that is a great example to what the Bible speaks of when it says, train up a child in the way 
that he should go and when they're old, they will not depart from it. We, we praise God for great training and childhood upbringing. Thank God for that. Are you happy to be in the house of God today? Uh, praise the Lord. You are the brave ones who came out today in spite of the snow. So I want to congratulate you. And please pat yourself on the back and say, you are a brave one. <laughs> praise, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Uh, why don't you stand with me briefly as we read our scripture reading. Once again, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 through 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 through 10. And the word of God says, Unless I should what? He should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations. A thorn where? In the flesh was given to me. A messenger of who? Of Satan to do what? To buffet me lest I be exalted above measure. Verse 8. Concerning this thing... I pleaded with the Lord, how many times? Three times. Three times that it might depart from me. And he said to me what? My grace, is my grace is sufficient for you. For my strength is what? Made perfect how? In weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, re in reproaches, in needs, in persecution, in distress. For what? For Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then what? Say that again. When I am weak, when I am weak, then I am strong. My subject today is Finding strength in weakness. Finding strength in weakness. Let us pray. Loving Father, as we open your word once again, we ask, O oh Holy Spirit, to come and take your place behind this desk. Speak to us now and enlighten our hearts. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Let me ask you a couple of questions. Is there anything in your life you would like to do, but you're afraid to try? Is there, or is there, or are there things you would love to do, but you feel that you don't have what it takes to achieve it. Well, I have great news for you. You are in good company. There are many more than you know in this world who have felt the exact same way. They felt they didn't have what it took. They felt they did not have the abilities or the intellect or the finances, or the connections, or the networks, but they stepped out in faith. And God came through for them. Amen. You know, I would like to share with you an experience, not of my own, but of a family that is very close to my wife. The young lady who is the mother of the young man I'm going to talk to you about. He was 16 years old. My wife grew up with her, know her and all the family very well. This young man did not allow anything or anyone to despise his, his youth. This young man at 16 years old in high school... He decided that he would go and step out 
against what was norm in his hometown and in his posse of friends and classmates. And in fact, he picked up giving Bible studies to people and he would do preaching even though he didn't know anything about homiletics or how to prepare a sermon or how to exegese a passage of scripture and all those fancy stuff. But he just went and shared from the sincerity of his heart, preaching the word of God, teaching others in Bible study. And many people were baptized through his instrumentality. He went to a retreat a few weeks ago with some of his classmates whom he is getting ready to graduate with later this year. And as they were there on the beach, he was sharing with his dad the excitement that he had a week prior when he was conducting a week of prayer. And from that week of prayer, several young people decided to give their life to Jesus and be baptized. And as they were talking and having a good time on the beach, suddenly a big wave came and, and took five young people. They, are, they were floating in these inflated beds. And they were just having a good time and having fun. And this big wave came and, and took them out. And this young man, who he was standing there, there with his dad. He, he, he saw what was happening. People started shouting and screaming. And, and he thought to himself, but I am not a great swimmer. And he said it to his dad, I'm not a great swimmer, but... My sister is in danger and my friends are in danger. And without thinking it any longer, he rushed into the sea and jumped in and swam out. And he, he brought one in and he brought the second one in and he brought the third one, the fourth one in. And, and, and the fifth one, he brought that person until a certain point and that person was able to come out and be pulled out by some others. And when they looked around, they didn't see him any longer. By that time, some of the, the, the emergency crews that they had called to, to help with the rescue, they came by and they start going out and combing the area. And they had these little floaters that they were, they was, they were, they were sailing around, searching, looking and looking and looking and looking. And he was nowhere to be found. His father remained on that beach. All day, he sent out a WhatsApp message and he said, brethren, pray for me. Pray for me. This is hard. It's difficult. It's the most, it's the most painful thing in my life. My son has drowned. Just pray that we find his body. That's all I'm praying for. Please pray with me. And perhaps about a day later, they found him. And his father said something that I will never forget. He said, my son is sealed now. My son is sealed now. Whatever plans the enemy had for him, it can no longer be materialized. Because he's sealed now. For eternity. Today I'm talking about finding strength in weakness. And my question to us is, beloved, how many of us have win even one soul? This young man in his 16 years on earth, he won several souls for Jesus because he availed himself to the power of God in spite of his weakness. And even in the last day of his life, he was still focused on making a difference in someone else's life. I have discovered that many Christians live their life in this world without ever having the true impact that God wants them to have because they just never try anything. 
The reason that many of us don't try anything, it is because we are waiting to see that we have all that we need before we try. We don't trust in the invisible God. We want to trust in the things we can see, we can touch, or we can taste. But the word of God says to us, brothers and sisters, that the righteous shall live by faith. Living by faith means that I don't trust in my humanity, but I trust in the power of the spirit of God. I've discovered from reading scripture, beloved, that I serve a God who loves people who have weakness. I don't see nowhere in the Bible that God is waiting for people to make themselves perfect or make themselves extraordinary before he can say, yes, I think you are ready for me to use you now. So many of us don't tell somebody about Jesus simply because we believe that I didn't go to seminary I, I don't know the Bible like that but you have a story to tell tell somebody what Jesus has done for you he has done much many things for you, you, you are, you're awake this morning aren't you not you found salvation you found everlasting life in him therefore you got a story to tell Stop looking at your weaknesses and begin to focus on the power of God. Amen. I see in the Bible that when God was ready to call people to go and exploit for him, he did not go to the most prestigious universities on earth to find the people that he needed. But God went to common people, regular men and women. And when he called Abraham, the Bible says that Abraham was old. When he called Jacob, Jacob was a deceiver. Leah, Leah, she was cross-eyed and a rejected wife. He called Joseph, who was abused and sold into slavery. He called Moses, who was a runaway murderer and a stutterer. He called Gideon, who was an insecure man. He called Samson, who was codependent. He called Rahab, who was a prostitute. He called David, who had an affair and all kinds of family issues. He called Elijah, who was depressed and suicidal. He called Jeremiah, who was run down and, 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 and disheartened. He called Jonah, who was uncommitted. He called Naomi, who was a widow, penniless and lonely. He called John the Baptist, who was an eccentric. He called Peter, who was impulsive and hot-headed. He called Martha, who was too busy for herself. He called the Samaritan woman, who had numerous failed marriages and a bad reputation. He called Zacchaeus, who was disliked and unpopular. He called Thomas, who had no faith. He called Paul, who had a poor health and an ugly past. He called Timothy, who was too young and too shy. He called Lazarus, who was dead. God called people with weaknesses. So stop looking at your inadequacies as a way to excuse that you cannot do what God wants you to do in this life. You see, God wants us to never lose sight of the fact that whatever we do in life and whatever we do in his cause, it's not by the, our intellect, not by our talents, and not by our abilities, rather by the generosities of God. We have been chosen. Not because we are better than anyone else, but instead to be an example of the power of God working through the frailty of human agency. The Bible does not give us any specificity about Paul's weakness or infirmity. All it tells us is that Paul had an infirmity and he was buffeted, it says, by an agent of the devil. 
He prayed three times and God said to him, chill out. Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. Don't bring up the subject to me anymore. But perhaps I believe, I believe and I want to suggest that perhaps God did not allow Paul to register what his infirmity was because maybe if he did, some of us would be focused on what the infirmity was as opposed to focusing on the fact that it doesn't matter what the infirmity is, the power of God is still consistent. So, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7 through 9, we'll read something very interesting. Paul says, unless I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. Then in verse 8 he says concerning this thing. I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my strength, this is God speaking, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, this is Paul speaking now, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. I find in these verses, beloved, and I want you to write this down, three principles that are found in these verses that we just read. There are three principles. Principle number one. Principle number one. God does not focus on our weaknesses. Satan does. God does not focus on our weaknesses. Satan is the one who does. Notice what Paul said. He says, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan, to buffet me. When I read in the book of Revelation, the, in chapter 12, the word of God says that Satan is the accuser of the brethren. So may I say today with the authority of Christ that whenever you meet anyone who is masquerading as a Christian and comes to you accusing his brethren, that's an agent of Satan. Because God does not focus on our weakness. That's the work of the devil. That's the principle number one. Principle number two. Principle number two is... God allows us to come face to face with our weaknesses to help us stay humble. Notice what Paul says. He says, unless I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me. Now, understand how Paul came to this conclusion. When Jesus called the original 12 apostles, these men were going around with him, listening to him, learning from him, sleeping in the same places that he slept, eating the same food with him. They were breaking bread together, walking along together, going to experiences together. Paul was nowhere to be found. As a matter of fact, he was out there living a different life. He was persecuting the people of God. He was an enemy of Christ. But now, God called him. He entered into the fellowship of the kingdom of God. And even though he was not one of the originals, he received more visions and revelations than all of the others. He did not just come in as a Johnny come lately, but he came in and became big among them. That kind of stuff can make your head swell. 
And now you can start feeling that. Hey guys, I know you guys were hanging out with Jesus, but look at me now. I've written more books than you guys. I have arrived more than you are. You are I, I, I am the big guy here now. So everybody need to respect me. You see, so Paul understood that God says, you know what? I need to keep you humble. And just so you're not be tempted for the abundance of the revelations you have received, I am going to allow that you be buffeted. Principle number three. Principle number three is we are confronted with our weaknesses to teach us total dependence on God. To teach us total dependence on God. Because you see, beloved, we have a tendency to be self-sufficient. We want to do things on our own. We want to work things out. As a matter of fact, one of the things that that, 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 that we we hear uh, as an excuse, uh, more so than any other excuse, when anyone is being presented with the gospel of Jesus Christ, they always say, Almost as as clockwork, they always say, I have some things I'm working out, I need to work on them, and then when I get them ready, and I'm ready, I'll come. You can't get yourself ready. If you could make yourself ready, then you don't need Jesus. So Paul and us needed to learn total dependency on God. And that's why he said, That God told him, my grace is sufficient for you. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Now, beloved. The question now that we need to ask is the following. What is a weakness? What is a weakness? There is a Greek word that is translated weakness in the New Testament. And also the same word is used in the Septuagint version. That's the first Greek translation of the Old Testament that was in circulation in the time of Jesus. The same word, whenever weakness is cited in scripture, was also used. And that word is asteneia. Astenia. And what is the meaning of astenia? Astenia means feebleness of body or mind. It also means moral frailty. So watch this now, beloved. Watch this. Watch this. There are two areas that are covered by the word weakness. How many areas did we say? Two areas. These are the two areas. Area number one, moral frailty. Area number two, any form of limitation. Moral frailty or any form of limitation. Let's look at those two quickly. Moral frailty. A moral frailty implies any form of sin or vice or character flaw. God does not expect us to identify ourselves by our moral frailties, but by his power instead. There are so many people in our world today, even in the church, who has chosen to identify themselves by their moral frailties. Give an example. People say they, they you know, and, and this is this is this is science, no versus the spirit world. Science says if you are an alcoholic, you are always an alcoholic. But I want to say today that yes, you might have been an alcoholic, but when you were born again, Jesus made you sober. Don't claim that that's what you are anymore. Don't identify yourself by your moral frailty. But identify yourself by your strength and your power and your victory in God. 
You see, the word says that Jesus came to earth to save humanity from the strongholds of iniquity and from the destruction that comes through sin. You and me, beloved, we are not necessarily punished by, for rather, we are not necessarily punished for our sins. Rather, we are punished by our sins. Sin destroys. So the reason why I avoid sin is not because God is going to come and whip me. No, no. I avoid it because sin destroys. That's why we must hate sin because sin is our enemy. Sin wants to destroy us. So therefore, my friends, brothers and sisters, find strength in finding strength in weakness. We find it when we totally surrender our all to God. Give him your everything. The good and the bad. Our weaknesses and our strengths. Turn it over to him. The Bible says, submit yourself to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. So as a result, the journey of how we overcame becomes our testimony. The story of our personal salvation, that which was our downfall, which was our greatest weakness, now becomes our strength. It becomes something that God can use <laughs> to save the souls in his kingdom. This is what 1 John chapter 5 and verse 10 says. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 10. It says, he who believes in the Son of God, what? Has the testimony where? In himself. He who does not believe God has made him a liar. Because he has not believed the testimony that God has given of his Son. So when Christ comes to you and me. And takes residence in us. Now we become God's testimony. Don't hide your story. Because your story is the strength that your weakness wanted to steal from you. So the word of God, beloved. Tells us that God does not need you to make yourself perfect, inerrant, or even self-righteous for that matter before he can use you. That means, beloved, that God is expecting us not to have reliance on our human strength. But we must acknowledge our competences. Yes, acknowledge them. But and not hesitate to use them. However, we should not put our dependency on them. Because when it comes to matters of salvation, only the power of God can make us whole. If we rely on our human frailty, God will never be able to use us. Do you remember that text when Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus said uh, that, 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 that let your light so shine before men and let them see your good works. And glorify your father which is in heaven because if anyone has a lamp he will not take that lamp and put it under a basket for a long time I used to wonder what is the basket Jesus is referring to here and I've discovered beloved that that basket is over human flesh you see, God wants to use us through the spirit, but when we put the flesh ahead of the spirit, God can't use us. Because when flesh goes before the spirit, ego is present, and where ego is present, ministry disappears. God cannot use someone who is self-exalted like the enemy is. He was kicked out of heaven for having the audacity to want to be God. So therefore, he came to earth. He has inflicted humanity with the same plague that he has. And the flesh is self-sufficiency. The flesh is self-righteousness. The flesh is self-centeredness. 
In 2013, I preached a two-part series right here entitled uh, the, the, the Judas Syndrome. In that message back then, I told you that having a vice does not necessarily disqualify you from being a servant of Christ. However, not surrendering that vice to the power of Jesus will eventually disqualify you. If you do not take control of your vice, it will control you. If you do not bring your vice to Jesus and allow him to destroy it, it will destroy you. That's how it works. It's a simple equation. God is saying, bring me your mess and I will make you blessed. What we don't confront, beloved, we will not overcome. So please understand, please understand that this confrontation with our weakness of character or our sin is not shameful, belittling, or condemning. We must understand the principle here. That's not how God operates. You see, shaming and belittling, that's the work of the devil. He is the accuser of the brethren. As a matter of fact, what I've learned from scripture is that God instructs us that if we patiently lead someone to repentance, he says, and the Lord shall cover a multitude of sins. It is the devil who wants to take your sins and hang them. You know, they don't do that here, but you know, some of you came from... Caribbean and other places, we, we, we wash clothes and we hang it outside, right? We, we hang it on the line outside. And then anyone passing by, driving by, they see all your clothes just waving in the wind. Okay, so, so the devil wants to hang a line <laughs> and take all your sins and your mess and hang them out for the world to see because he wants to shame. He wants to belittle. He wants to destroy. But God is not interested in that. God wants to save. And that's why he invites us to repentance. You see, what God does is rather a personal and gentle confrontation. It causes the sinner to cast his weaknesses and all his cares on the one who is all powerful, who is merciful, and who is forgiving. Because God has no use for sins. So he, 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 he don't need to store them anywhere. Neither does he need to hold on to them. He has no use for it. God wants to get rid of sin. So, so look at what scripture tells us about you and me, the church, as agents of the spirit of God, how we should approach situations. Galatians chapter 6 verses 1 and 2. Galatians chapter 6 verse 1 and verse 2. The apostle says this, brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are what? You who are what? You who are church members, you who have a position in the church, you who wants to defend the honor of the church, you who want to rid the church of sin, You who want to say enough is enough, the standards are going down, we got to do something about it, we got to take it in hand, who should go? You who are spiritual. So by the love of God, if you know you're not spiritual, please stay out. Stay out of it. I heard, I heard, I heard... I, but my brother, I read a very insightful thing that one of my favorite authors, John C. Maxwell, said. It was so profound, I took note of it. He said, he said, when confronting people, if you don't care about a relationship with them, just let it go. 
Because if you confront people you don't care to have a relationship with, it will not go well. So he says, only confront when you value the relationship more than what happened. And your goal is to save the relationship. So you want to get that situation, whatever it is, out of the way so that the relationship can get back on track. But if you don't really care to have a relationship, just walk away and let it go. So he continues. So do you who are spiritual, he says, to restore such a one, how? In the spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Wow. In other words, when you confront, don't go there like a big, big, bad something. Oh, oh, I'm so disappointed in you. How could you do this? You have shamed us all. Shut up. You got your stuff on so. The only difference is that perhaps nobody found out. So just go with a humble heart knowing that God has been merciful to me. God has been good to me. Therefore, therefore, because he has restored me, I'm coming here so you can have the same fate like me. It's about reconciliation with God. It's not about punishment. When I discovered these things, and I've shared this with you before, when I discovered these things, I repented for all the people I punished in my early ministry. Because I was, quote unquote, protecting the integrity of the church. Who made me God? I am no longer interested in punishing people. But my sole desire is to restore them for Jesus. Amen. Because that's the ministry he has given us. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 tells us clearly that he has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That's what he gave us. He never made us judge and executioners who are us to judge and condemn and to punish and to hurt people. Rather, I see in the word that the Lord says that anyone who dared to hurt one of these little ones, it is better for him to take a millstone and tie it around his neck and go jump in the sea. And, and, and maybe, and I'm adding this piece, I'll jump in the sea in the areas where they haven't found the bottom. Because God sent his son to this world not to condemn it, but to save it. God's intention is to redeem the sinner and to save the sinner and then turn around and use that sinner for his glory. Amen. Area number two, area number two, any form of limitation. Area number two of weakness, any form of limit, li limitation. You see, the, the word, the, the, there are limitations that we all have. Some limitations are inherited ones from our ancestry. Uh, limitations sometimes that we have no power to change. These may be physical limitations like a handicap or a chronic genetic illness or a disability and so on. It may also refer to emotional limitation like a painful memory, a, a personality disorder, a trauma wound or an inborn predisposition. We all have weaknesses, that's the fact. We all have flaws. We are a beautiful package of imperfections. That is why whenever I encounter some folks who say, I am going to leave the church where I am at because the people they are hypocrites and the people there, they're, they're not good and they're not kind and, and they're going on and on. And I, say, I usually say, you know, just, just be mindful that the church you're going to have people have issues as well. 
So if, if you're an issues driven individual, you may drive yourself out of the faith because there's nowhere you're going to go on this side of eternity where you're not going to find people with issues. It reminds me of that story of uh, uh, that great uh, British preacher, Charles Spurgeon, and he, he preached his heart out one Sunday. And at the door, as he was greeting parishioners, one young man came to him and said, uh, Dr. Spurgeon, I am leaving your church. He said, why would you do that? He said, this is my last day because I have found that your church is full of hypocrites. <laughs> and he said, I'm so sorry to hear. He says, yes, I'm leaving. So he said, where are you going? He say, I am going on a quest to find the perfect church. He shook Dr. Spurgeon's hand and then began to walk away. And as he was walking away in his sanctimonious walk, Dr. Spurgeon said, could you do me a favor? He turned back and he said, sure, uh, absolutely. Uh, wh what would that be? He says, when you find that church, by the love of God, don't join it. He said, why would you say that? He says, because if you join it, that day will no longer be perfect. <laughs> oh, beloved. Some of you will get that later. <laughs> I'm here to tell you that God loves imperfect people. God accepts us just as we are with our flaws and imperfections, be it physical, emotional, intellectual, or spiritual. God loves to give us the power to rise, to rise above the things that so easily beset us. That's his specialty. You see, God is not limited by our limitations for human's extremities are God's opportunities. Oh, my friends, if you have been holding out because you feel that you're not ready for God to use you, I am telling you today in the name of Jesus, step up! Because, it, because it's not about what you can or cannot do, but it's what God can do. I came by here to tell you that God wants you to find strength in your weakness so that like Paul, you may say most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities uh, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in my infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecution, in distress for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So finally, 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 finally. Let, let's, let's deal with the how now. How do we find strength in weakness? How do we find strength in weakness? There are four keys to unlock the strength that are imprisoned by your weaknesses. Are you ready for them? Number one. Key number one. Acknowledge, admit your weakness. Acknowledge or admit your weakness. You see, brothers and sisters, God wants us to stop pretending. Stop acting like you've got it all together. Because even the people you are telling that you're just so fine, they know you got issues. So, so, so let's stop trying to fool ourselves and to fool others and let's be real. And then church, let's be ready to lend a compassionate air to folks when they are ready to unload. Amen. Don't say how are you and then keep walking. Stay, stay, stay for the answer. Because the answer one day may just not be I'm fine. 
So, 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 so be honest with yourself because God cannot be and will not be impressed by our putting ons and our self sufficiency. This is a humble recognition. And it necessitates the acceptance of our human fallenness. You see, spiritual warfare will be won not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Finding strength in weakness demands a humble recognition of areas where we are weak, but yet we believe that our weakness is, not, uh, uh, is no match to the power of Jesus. So we need to be humble and recognize that Jesus is the only true source of salvation and strength for humanity. But please, after you have used this key, don't stay with this key only. You need to keep moving on. Don't, don't stay dwelling, admitting only that you have weakness. Get key number two. And key number two is this. Write this down. Recognize your weakness as the corruption of your true strength. Recognize that your weakness is the corruption of your true strength. You see, you see, beloved, you see, here is something that, that, that I want you to never forget righteousness goodness and perfection existed for millenniums before imperfection came into the world what that means is beloved that perfection and righteousness and goodness can exist all on its own but 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 imperfection can only exist when it has corrupted that which is perfect. Imperfection cannot exist on its own. So whenever you are dealing with imperfection, take your eyes off the imperfection and look around. There is the other side of what has been corrupted. That is the true strength that the devil wants to hide from you. And that's why he wants to keep us focused on, I got this issue, I got this issue, I got this issue, I got this issue, I got, yeah, 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 we know you got the issue. Now lift your head up, look around, because behind you, there is the power that God has given you to overcome. So understand that your weaknesses are the corruption of something great within you. And that's why Paul heard from the Lord when he says, My grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Your weakness increases your capacity for sympathy. It increases one's compassion and our capacity for ministry. For only a heart full of compassion can connect with people. You see, if we were to walk around uh, feeling that we have no issues at all, we will just walk over people. We become judgmental of people because we don't know where they have walked. That's why I have a savior, the Bible says, who has been touched with the feelings of our infirmity. He was tempted in all things, yet without sin. He is not ignorant of what I go through. So he wants us to recognize that just how you have found your strength as you have traced back from your weakness, you can teach others to do the same. There's a powerful lesson in this, beloved. When God calls us to service in his cause, wherever he puts us to serve, 
Whatever line of duty we are called to serve in, we are put there not because we are the best, not because there is no one better that he could use in that area of expertise, but watch this, rather he calls us and he puts us there for the opposite reasons. God allows us to be placed where we are most vulnerable. And he does so in order to give us the opportunity to constantly be confronted with our own need of his power. His goal is to help us see and overcome by his power. For it is only when we let go of ourselves and trust in his power and his power only that we will see our breakthrough. Key number three, key number three is don't be afraid to use your weakness. Don't be afraid to use your weakness. People, especially the young people, beloved, in our church, they need to know our story. They need to know that they are not the only ones messing up that we messed up too back in the day or maybe even not so much back in the day <laughs> they need to know that if God can use me he can use you too you see I see something interesting in order for Jesus to save us it was necessary for him to hang on the cross and show us his wounds. So beloved, the things you are embarrassed about, some of the things that perhaps you are most ashamed of, you want to protect it with secrecy. You are reluctant to share. These may be the very tools that God can use most powerfully to heal someone else. Some of us may be crippled by uncontrolled or uncontrollable circumstances such as financial limitations and relational dysfunctions. But please know that the real issue is not that we have issues, but what we do with them. You see on the cross. Jesus' wounds were bare. Before everyone to see. Isaiah tells us that by his stripes. We are healed. After his resurrection. He showed his wounds. Several times. To give hope and encouragement. To his defeated stricken disciples. I'm here today to say that God can use your weakness and your pain, your traumas and your limitations, and turn them into powerful saving instruments. When others see God using you in spite of your weaknesses, it will give them hope. They will be motivated to think, maybe God can use me too. So, beloved, we need to make ourselves vulnerable and let others see our wounds. And finally, key number four. Key number four is give thanks for your weakness. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 12 verse 10, he says, therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, for when I am weak, then I am strong. The Bible tells us that in all things, give thanks. You see, the natural tendency is to deny weakness, to defend them, to excuse them, to resent them, or worse, to ignore them. So we come to church week after week, hiding our pain. 
We make up excuses about, oh, you see, I, I can't trust nobody in my church. I don't trust those people. And we see all kinds of stuff. But, but, but beloved, if all of us continue to have uh, that feeling about this group that God has set aside and put together to be a support group for the rest of us, it will never become what God wants it to be. So we hide and we deny our emotional scars. And the problem is, beloved, that these things don't remain hidden. They will always come out. And that's why so many times in, 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 in the kingdom of God, in his church, in this space where men and women are to be moved and controlled by the spirit of God, because we have not emptied ourselves. From those emotional garbage that we're carrying, then we come to church and we fight and we, we, we get on each other's nerves and, and, and we tear down and we compete uh, and, and, and we, 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 we profile and, we, and, and we, we do all these things that are contrary to the kingdom because we have unresolved situations we have not emptied out. So, so many times the rude behaviors we see in church are people who are wounded. Hurting people hurt people. And if we can't find healing here, then where? Now I'm not saying that all cases can be resolved in church. Some cases we may need some therapy and that's okay. If you got cancer, you're not going to just come church and pray. You're going to go see the doctor too, right? So if you have some kind of emotional dysfunction that you are dealing with, by the love of Jesus, go find the necessary professional help that you need. It will only make you a better Christian. It doesn't take away from your faith. It adds to it. It is time that God's people may allow God to take their weaknesses and make it in their strengths. So I, I want to say to us today, don't be afraid of your weaknesses, for your weaknesses cannot eclipse the power of God. The contrary, to the contrary, your weaknesses make room for the manifestation of divine power. Yes. Brother Altino, I need your help. Uh, I want you to help me with the keyboard. I need you to give me a, a synthetic sound. I want to end with this. I read this story of a rich man who became a widow. He became a widower and he had an only son. His son and him got very close. I want you to keep in mind, beloved, that I'm still talking about the four keys. Let me just say them quickly to remind you. Admit your weakness. Recognize your weakness as the corruption of your true strength. Number three, don't be afraid to use your weaknesses. And number four, give thanks for your weaknesses. This man, he was wealthy. He had a large estate and he would collect works of art. He had all the, the famous artists that you can think about. Picasso and Raphael and and Rembrandt and all these great ones. He, he had them all and he was the envy of so many that run around in his circles. The Vietnam War came around and his son was drafted and he was sent to Vietnam. He was a brave soldier and he died in combat. The story said that he, he was rescuing some of his comrades and as he was carrying one of his fellow soldiers as soldiers at his shoulder 
he was struck in his heart by a bullet and he died instantly. When the father received the news, you know, he got that knock on his door and these uniformed soldiers came there and they delivered a flag and they delivered the news. This man fell into deep grief. His son was all he had. His wife was already gone. And his son was his pride and joy. He grieved day and night. Day and night. He went through bouts of depression. and All kinds of emotional challenges. One Christmas, there was a knock on his door. And when he went to the door, there was a young man standing there with a large package in his hand. And the young man said to him, sir, you don't know me. But I am the soldier that your son gave his life to save. It was me that he was carrying on his shoulder that day when he was struck by a bullet in his heart and died instantaneously. He said, your son loved you very much. He always talked about you and he always spoke of your great love for art. So he said, I am not a great artist. But I know your son will be happy for me to give this to you. And he gave him the large package he had in his hands. And when the father opened it up, it was a portrait of his son. He was so struck. By how this young man was able to capture in this portrait. He was able to capture his son's personality. He was deeply drawn by his son's eyes. He could not stop staring and tears welled up in his eyes. And he began to weep uncontrollably. And the young man held him. And consoled him. Then he, he, he tried. He said, so, l let me write you a check for this. And the young man said, no, I could not take your money, sir. He said, this is a gift. He says, I'm a wealthy man. I could pay. He said, no, I don't want. I cannot take your money. Your son has already given his, given his life to save mine. This is just a small thing that I want to do to show my appreciation. The man took the portrait of his son and he moved, removed one of his uh, uh, expensive pieces that he had in his living room and he hung the portrait of his son in that place. And every day he will come out and look at the face of his son. And anyone, anyone who would come to visit in his home, he will take them there and show them the portrait of his son and speak of him and how he was a hero who saved lives and died saving others. A few years passed and this man died. His son being his only heir and now also deceased he rewrote his will and in his will he said that all his estate should be auctioned off so the day for the auction came and all the people in his circles all the people who have always envied all the pieces of work of art that he had and had collected over the years who really wanted to get their hands on it. Oh, that auditorium was just so full of people who call themselves the sophistication of society. They were there, they were ready. And sitting on the podium, there was the portrait of his son. And then the auctioneer uh, called to order the auction and he said, well, ladies and gentlemen, we are ready to begin the auction today. And we begin with this portrait of the owner of the estate's son. 
I would love to begin this auction of the owner's son by asking for $200. Anyone, $200 for the son. Silence in the room. No one is saying a word. Soon after, in the back of the room, someone shouted, We came here for Rembrandt and Picasso. We don't want the sun. Get that out of the way. Bring out the real art. And the auctioneer continued patiently. The sun. Anyone, $200 for the sun. The crowd is beginning to get restless and people beginning to get fidgety and, and, and you know, and all these uh, ladies begin to, to, to take off their gloves and to fan themselves and like, what's going on in here? We, we, we need to get on with the real action. The auctioneer kept saying, $200 for the sun, anyone, $200. And then, in the back of the room, he wasn't a part of those who were going to partake in the auction. There was the gardener who had taken care of the grounds of the estate for the owner and his son for many years. He was not a rich man at all. As a matter of fact, he did not have $200 to bid for the portrait of the son and he timidly raised his hand and the auctioneer said sir you want to bid $200 and say no no I, I'm, I'm so sorry please forgive me I know I don't belong here because I can't afford any of the things that are going to be auctioned in this room but but since it seems like nobody wants the portrait of the son just so that we can proceed with auction um, I knew the son I love the father and I love the son all I have is ten dollars sir can I bid ten dollars for the son and he said well well since there's no other bid on the floor well we we accept the bid for ten dollars for the son is there twenty dollars anyone with twenty dollars for the son Silence in the room. Somebody said, give the man the, the, the portrait of the sun and let's just get on with this. $10 going one. $10 going twice. $10 thrice sold for the, to the gentleman the portrait of the sun for $10. And then when he delivered the portrait of the son to the gardener. The auctioneer then said, ladies and gentlemen, the auction is over. <laughs> and the people says, what are you talking about? We came here for Picasso. We came here for Rembrandt. We came here. And he said, please, please, can everybody quiet down? Let me explain. There was a clause in the will that said, that I could not reveal this clause until this moment. And the clause said the following. That the, the portrait of the son was to be auctioned off first. And whoever purchased the son. Inherit the entire estate. <laughs> oh ladies and gentlemen. This man. The gardener. He came to a room where he felt that he did not belong. He recognized his own weakness. He recognized that in his weakness was a corruption of his true strength. So he was not afraid to use his weakness. He gave thanks for it. He exposed it before everybody else. He stepped out in faith. And when he did, he found strength he never knew he could ever have. So you went from cleaning the grounds to become the owner of the entire thing. So brothers and sisters, my appeal today is very simple. If you have the sun, you got everything you need. 
quit being afraid. Quit being timid. Quit being bashful. And step out boldly in faith. Because he who has the son has everlasting life. How many today want to say with me, I take the son because I love the father and I love the son. May God keep us always walking in faith and in trust of the one that can give it us, give it to us and give us all that we need. God bless you. We will now stand and turn our hymns to hymn 524. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus.
God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Thank you, Pastor, for reminding us of the wonderful gift of Christ to us. And now may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest, remain, and abide with us both now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Lord, I give you my heart. I give family who came all the way from Martinique to visit us in service today. Where is that family? Are they? Oh, over there. We are happy to have you today. And uh, God bless you for worshiping with us today. And please, when you are back in uh, New York, please come and visit us again. Thank you very much. <laughs> 